Hey guys, what's up everybody? Welcome to my YouTube channel and this is a video with a little bit a different format. In this video I want to talk a little bit with you why your kick drums probably does not sound as good as you want them to sound. So I took some notes here on my smartphone because of course I can't remember. Yeah, I don't know all these points, but check out that one. Camera is focusing. Perfect. So yeah, so we'll start. Let's start with the first point. Uh, the first point in the row is the wrong sample. I mean, I think this should be obvious, but it's not. So when you make, I'm talking just about techno, of course, because all the other kinds of music I have no idea from. Yeah, I can maybe have a feeling what is good, what is bad, but I have no idea how to do this, honestly. So first, the kick drum sample is very important. There are two different ways of choosing a kick drum sample. The first way is you choose a kick drum sample, which is totally like, let's call it complete, uh, talking about processing. So for example, the kick drums I've made for production music live or also other other kick drums like Riemann stuff, Sennheiser, Sennheiser, however they are called, uh, techno kick drums, like the kick drums which have everything inside. They are compressed, like overdriven as hell. They have uh, yeah, like rumble and everything is inside. Easiest way, but also the most unflexible way. So this means you would cannot really change the timing like uh, or specific areas of that kick drum. So this is why I'm not using this way usually when I make music. Sometimes when I'm lazy, I do. And the other one is a kick drum, which is not that crazy processed, compressed and complex, which is easier. But this one needs more processing. And this is what we are going to talk about in the next steps. So what could be done right and what could be done wrong for the processing of this kick drums. So let me check the next point on my list. Yeah, wrong frequency range. So a kick drum normally for techno should have its peak at between let's say 42 and 60, 65 hertz. So not less, not more. Better is starting from 45, 46 and going to 58. So keep that in mind when you choose your sample or when you tune your kick drum, then because everything which is above has not enough bass, in my opinion, not enough pressure to really hit you in the club and everything which is below is way too deep. It is, yeah, this is crazy stuff. This is just almost not possible to hear. It's just, uh, yeah, rumble. And uh, we need rumble, but not for the main part of the kick drum. Of course, there are frequencies below 40 hertz in the sample or in the sound itself, but not in the main, on the main peak. I hope you got this. So next point, um, bad EQing. So Bad EQing means usually when you have an EQ and you have a lot of boosts and cuts and something crazy going on, like, I don't know, cr just crazy stuff, then maybe you've chosen the wrong sample. So start again from the first point, choose the right sample. And uh, normally a, a kick drum EQing should look like roll off a little bit of the bottom end, take down some unwanted boxy frequencies below, let's say 150 and 250 or 100 and 250 hertz, and take down some resonances above that frequency, if they are resonances, not more and not less. That's everything you need for a nice EQ'd kick drum, in my opinion. So this is EQing. Next point is let me check, where are we? Yeah, no space, of course. It's not really the kick drum, which is making the problem. But when 
you're having no space for your kick drum in your total mix, then your kick drum sounds crap. That's how it goes. Yeah. So there are some super simple solutions for that. You can either do sidechain compression with your kick drum or whatever signal you want to use to compress, or you can, uh, yeah, of course you can like this, uh, or you can roll off all the low end on every other sound than the kick and the bass. So this is what you need to keep in mind because the speaker is just able to play the sound either from the kick drum, the bass, or from the bass or from another element. It is not able to play all of them together at the same time. This is why we care so much about EQing, sidechain compression and splitting frequencies when we make music. So next point, uh, compression and limiting. Especially in techno, I've learned that lesson just a few months, maybe to a year ago. It is super important to compress and limit your low end. When you watch all these tutorials and when you yeah, make those, I don't know, rumbling kick drum sounds, in the end of almost every nice chain, there is a very fast compressor or a limiter or both. So because you want to bring your sounds together, which means you want to take down the transients from the kick drum and you want to increase like the rumble and all the rhythmic stuff going on behind that first transient of the kick drum. And so compression plays a huge role in, in that part. For me, when I, when I make techno kick drums, they almost have no dynamic range. Which is, I mean, probably you can hate me for that, explaining it like this now, but this is basically how it sounds in techno. When you listen to all those tracks on Spotify and wherever, most of them have a, like a totally crunched, whatever, compressed low end. And when, when you want to achieve this kind of sound, you need to do that. That's it. Next point. Um, bad layering. Yeah, bad layering is important. So when you choose the kick drum and you layer that kick drum with another kick drum and maybe another kick drum, then be careful, for example, with the transients. So when you enable and put those kick drums into the simpler device and not all of them are starting directly on the same, like with the transient and the timing on the same spot, then in my opinion, the sound of the kick drum gets, I don't know how to explain this, uh, worse. Yeah, I mean, worse is maybe the right word, but it's not what I wanted to say. Um, yeah, muddy, but it's not muddy. Yeah, but you have, let's just imagine you have one kick drum with a few transients, but really fast. And this is not how it works. So keep that in mind when you're using uh, more than one sample that you change the timing in the simpler or in your DLW, wherever you are doing it, of the layered kick drums so that everything fits together nicely. This is important. Um, yeah. And as well, of course, I, I wrote that down here, volume. So of course, it's obviously should be obvious, but um, when you layer those kicks, then be really careful with the volume of every single kick drum you are layering. So they, yeah, I mean, the worst case would be just throw in three different kick drums and put them all into comp uh, compression and then, yeah, and then say, that's my techno kick. I mean, it could work, but usually it won't. So next point too much stereo width. When it comes to stereo width and low end, there are some people on the internet which are telling you keep everything in mono. And there are some who are telling you, you don't have to do that. 
I'm somewhere in between. I can tell you when you have frequencies above one, 100 hertz or let's say even lower like 60 hertz and you have a lot of stereo width in that frequencies then your kick sounds just muddy and is not punchy which is obviously the, the opposite of muddy isn't it however so uh, for example there is a track of OC and Verda it is called uh, let me short check Spotify Yeah, it's that one. So it's Mundo Shaban Bon whatever. But anyhow, when you listen to that track, it's a really nice track. But the low end for me is a way to like I don't know, moving around the room without just hitting tight yeah, into into the body of, I don't know, just listen to it on the big speaker and you will feel what I am feeling. I promise you. So I'm not telling that this is a, a, a bad track. It's a really nice track. Don't get me wrong. But the low end could be a little bit more in mono. M my personal opinion. So next point... Uh, too much distortion. I mean, if you want to make GABA or hardcore or Frenchcore or whatever kind of crazy music, then it's maybe okay. But always when you're using distortion and saturation, keep in mind that you're usually most of the time decreasing the amount of bass and punchiness you have in the sound. So if you're using a lot of distortion, you need at least, let's say, a second layer of the same kick drum with less or almost no distortion, just playing the very low frequencies to add some nice undistorted punch. Okay? I hope so. Uh, just three points to go. So... Of, co of course, uh, when your kick is not in key, yeah, so always think about the key of the kick drum. It's easy, just use a spectrum and check where the peak is of the kick drum and try to put it at least somewhere close to the key of your track because this makes the track yeah, easier to listen to, uh, makes it just nicer in the end and also easier to master and to mix in my opinion and uh, yeah unsuitable speakers of course when you're making tracks I mean this maybe belongs to a lot of you guys but when you're making tracks on speakers with less less than I don't know six inch uh, of, of, of a woofer then be really careful with those frequencies because Sometimes you just cannot hear them. I mean, some people are sending me tracks for mixing and they sound like nice on the smartphone. They sound nice uh, at home on the hi-fi system. But when I listen here in the studio, uh, I mean, the worst case I, I had was when a guy sent me a track with a kick drum, which had like the peak I was telling about in the beginning of the video at 60 hertz, which is nice but another one which was even higher at 30, so half of the frequency. So the same key, but a way too low. And this guy was not able to hear that, but you don't have to hear that because you can use spectrum analyzers or anything else just to check visually if your sample is doing this kind of, let's call it crap or not. So this is why you have to use at least some headphones which can go down to let's say 20 25 hertz so i'm using i'm not sponsored but i like i just like them i'm using those here which are yeah Bayer dynamics super uh cheap cheap not cheap but not high priced uh speakers they are 120 euro 
in, in Germany. They are worth every penny. Uh, I'm using them for playing PlayStation. I'm using them for traveling, listening to music, for producing, for checking mix downs, masters, everything. Because they have a nice low end, they have a nice top end, and they're also very comfortable uh, while having them the whole day on my head. So, yeah, I just like them. Anyhow, I can put you a link in the description if you're interested, but as I said, I'm not sponsored by Biodynamics. I just like the sound of those of those speakers. And if you want to buy speakers, and uh, when I bought them, I ordered like six pairs or maybe seven pairs of Biodynamics, and I tried them all out at home and sent the rest of them back and kept just this pair. So maybe you can try that as well. And the last point in the row is using magic racks. So I'm not judging those guys who are selling racks for everything actually, uh, but I don't use them. I've tried, I had the idea to sell one of those racks, like a magic kick drum rumble everything rack in the past, but I was not able to achieve the quality of low end I can achieve when I use every single track uh, by its own and, and use the effects different on the rumble, on the, I don't know, double kick, on the main kick, on the transient kick. When, when you're yeah, putting a way more effort into every single sound of those, then the result is much better than the result which is coming from those racks. So those racks are pretty fast, a nice way to start. But in the end, if you want to stand out, you need to make everything by yourself, in my opinion. So at least I do it by myself. And yeah, there is one point I forgot, which is also in the range of choosing the right sample. It is the sample length. So be careful that when you use the kick drum and the kick drum is a way too long and ends just before the next transient of the next kick drum start, then uh, keep in mind that when you're using a rumble and I don't know, a layered bass and everything, this could be a way too much. So when I have those kick drums and I have, for example, a kick drum I like, and it takes too much space, yeah, regarding like talking about time, then I usually cut the sample and fade it out. So it fits better into the whole low end of the group so that's it thanks for watching if you have any more ideas of what i forgot maybe then just let me know that in the, co in the comments also let me know if you like this kind of video format where i just sit on the couch and talk without any ableton no screen sharing whatever yeah so thanks for watching and yeah, don't let the coronavirus catch you just saying that because actually the world is going crazy. All markets are going down anyhow. So see you in a bit. Peace.